it's not being recorded. Okay, thank you for that. Well, uh, yeah, so, uh, so if you look at this state transition diagram, which I've drawn here, for the second scenario, the borrowing book scenario, and where we had this, this level of the system, it's not actually a system, it's a, it's a scenario, right? For this level of that uh, scenario, the second scenario, the borrowing book, this is the, the state transition diagram. It moves from shell state to approved state to borrowed state. So as we have said, transition A, has this particular event trigger availability of book transition? Yeah, and also in transition A, this is the action. When this is triggered, book is present, then you can pick book. In other words, this is the way you have to understand an action. An action is not an event. An action proceeds proceeds after an event. In other words, it an event is what triggers an action to happen. All right, like what triggers what triggers you to, you know, to buy chips when you are in, the, you know, you are passing along the streets? What triggers you to buy chips is just the availability of someone selling. You've just seen someone, so the availability of someone selling or the presence of a, of a vendor or a hawker or someone selling chips along the streets is what triggers you now to buy. So action is buying, all right? So that is the event. And so the action is picking the book and taking it to librarian the counter. It also says uh, it takes to the librarian the counter if they have any pending issues. So now that is what is it's called a, an action guard or what we call a guard condition. Right? An action guard or guard condition. Guard condition. A guard condition is a conditional statement also called an action guard. In other words, it guards this transition from move, from successfully completing to a different state. It guards, it prevents states from changing if that condition returns false. That's why it's called a guard. It, it prevents, all right, states from changing. So the action guard is what? So uh, if they have any pending issues, if students has pending issues, don't approve book, right? Okay. So that is the action guard. And in fact, uh, this is it. I'm going to change this. Look at how this will work. I'm going to put that there and then don't approve book. If no pending issues, if no pending issues, proceed to action. Proceed to action, and the action is proceed to more action, more action. All right, so I'm going to 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 have this here. I really want to arrange them so that you can see what's happening. So, action. You can actually call this action A, and you can call this action B. Okay, because there are different actions here. So proceed to action. So what is the action? Action is now what? Librarian, approve book. See, ku approve book ni ku enter the details of the student, kuchukua ID yake, things like that. Yeah. Librarian approves book. So when the librarian approves book, then the the what? The, the book is now approved. And then when how do we now move from approved to borrowed right so b i'm going to come back as we discuss state trans state chart diagram i'm going to come back to this action guard 
this action guard here, it's going to be very important when we discuss state chart diagram. Uh, so in uh, transition B, transition B, okay, in transition B, we have the event trigger. The event trigger, now here we're going to be a little more careful so that we don't mix things, right? So the event trigger is book approval. And then the action is student textbook with them. How have I come up with that? Because for you, for that book to be termed borrowed, to in other words, to be to be in borrowed state, the student has to have it in their custody. It is not just enough to borrow a book and do you borrow a book and just stand there at the librarian? No, you 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 go with it so that now it, it becomes your responsibility now to use it. It's now you, you have borrowed that book, right? So so for it to move from approved state to borrowed state, then you have to take it with you. So taking it with you is uh, the action, but that action is triggered by the book being approved. So this action, can you see this action here for transition A has become the event trigger for transition B. So that's how that works, right? But of course, here yeah, there is not there is no guard condition because after all if the book has already been approved then what are we testing again the book is already assigned to that student so the student can take it with them yeah so there's no guard or action guard there's no action guard all right well i was just showing this so that now i can show the the idea of state transition diagram now state transition diagram as i've said it accommodates it accommodates for showing it accommodates for showing of for showing of uh, two different states based on whether action guard based on action guard returning true and returning false it accommodates for showing of two different states based on action guard returning true and returning false. Now, this is what I mean. Now, uh, in state transition, in, in state chart diagram, we also use the same same uh, shapes, the the shaded circle or the black circle. It can be black, but I'm just going to shade it because it depends on the color you use. So the shaded circle, uh, the, the smooth rectangles, the rectangles with smooth edges, arcs or arrows, and also the, the shaded circle inside an unshaded circle, which is to show the final state. It uses the same, same ones, okay? So look at how this will happen. So for instance, I will now draw a state, I'll draw a state chart diagram, a state chart diagram for the library scenario above this one so of course this one i'm going to show a structure uh diagram for the library scenario above but let me start uh for the borrowing book for the borrowing book library scenario above so i'll i'll start with this one so that now we can expand using the knowledge you get okay so from this one all right we are going to draw a state transition diagram from that state chart diagram sorry for from uh, that from the borrowing book scenario now already we have the what we have the the state transition diagram for it now i want to show you what i want to show you is uh, how do we accommodate you see here we have a student who has a pen who can have a pending issue and therefore this this the the book will not be approved hence the book will not move from shelved to approved state but in state transition do you realize that uh, the the what the um, um you know the, the, that that condition if it transforms we do not show a state for it but we know that 
uh, if a book is has not been approved, then that book has moved from shelved state to denied state, right? From shelved state to denied state. So how do we show that? We show that using a state chart diagram. So this is how we show it. So of course, I'm going to copy everything here because we are going to use exactly these ones. Uh, let me group them. I think grouping them enables me to to copy them a better. So copy that. Let me paste it here. All right. So so we have A, and then we have B. In fact, no, it's not going to be B. Now let me show you. So this is what? This is shelved state, right? This is shelved. This is. This is a word. Okay. So. The thing about a uh, state chart diagram is that uh, now I'm going to change something here and I want you to notice what I'll change. So I'm, I'll first have to ungroup this so that they can be individual pieces. Now, this is not going to be borrowed uh, state. We are going to change it to just be the final state. And this final state, we are not going to give it a name. All right. We are not going to give it a name. Also, this one. We are not going to give it a name. Let me show you what I mean. You see, we had shelved, approved, and borrowed. Now, shelved, approved, and borrowed, these ones are going to be, they, they are going to be normal states. They are not going to be initial state and final state. They are going to be normal states. So this is what I mean. I'm going to have shelved state there. I'm going to have shelved. In other words, this uh initial state is not going to be named it's just going to be an initial state it's like a point from which the actions begin it has no name all right so we treat it like an abstract uh state a state that has no name a point from which uh some actions begin then this one we are going to treat it like a point from which some actions end are you together so both initial state and if initial state and final state are not going to be named in the in the in the what in the in the state chart diagram okay they are not going to be named they are just in the state chart diagram they just show an a position or a point from which different actions begin okay during the the change from state to state so shelved then um uh, it can move from shelved to borrowed based on a certain condition. I'll see what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to copy this and have a borrowed state here, right? So I'm going to have borrowed. I'm going to have borrowed. And uh, there we go. So borrowed state, so we'll have uh, an arrow to show transition there. Right, so, but a book can move from shelved to borrowed if they, there is no pending uh, issue, right? If there is no pending issue. So I'm just trying to fit this so that it can be look better. So it can move from shelved to borrowed if there is no pending issue. So if there is pending issue, how do we show it? Now this is how we show it. Look at how we will show when there is a pending issue or if there is an action guard. So you show it from the states. You show it from the states. Right there. And then it has moved from shelf state so this we're going to call it B.
So we can call this uh, state. Denied because of course if this is borrowed then this is denied and then of course uh, then look at how what I'm going to do here so I'm going to have a line here to show the this is the state that ends everything it doesn't have a name as we have said the initial state and the final state in the state chart diagram don't have names they are treated like abstract objects that are just abstract entities that because it's not an object abstract entities that that show where an action begins and that, that show where an action ends without a name so i'm going to have uh going to join this in other words if you can remember how flowcharts work from your introduction to structured programming or introduction to programming where you learn structured programming if you can remember how flowcharts work a flowchart works from start to stop so there is a start and there is a stop that start doesn't have a particular that start doesn't have a particular uh what it doesn't have a particular name it just starts and it is stop or regardless of the program which you are representing there is always a start and a stop so here in a state chart diagram also this is like the start and this is like the stop are you together and it never changes and it is not named yeah so uh i'm drawing a look at now how this looks like so this is transition c That is transition C. So, so look at what is happening here. So look at what is happening here. So we have the start, which is the initial state. Then the program, be, the scenario begins when the book is shelved. So it's at shelved state. Then if the book has no pending, the student has no pending issues, then he can borrow the book. If the student has pending issues, but he has taken the book to the counter, the book will be denied. And then the, the activities end at that point. So if he borrows, then the activity ends. If he, the book is denied, then activity ends. So we have now to, to show what happens. So in transition A, in fact, uh, then it's not a transition because it's just a start a transition that's why i've not named it so this is going to be transition a right and this b because this is an abstract element so we cannot say it moves from what to shelf it's just abstract right so that's why we have not had uh, we have not named that transition but uh So we'll begin from A. So A, the event trigger is what? Availability of book. And uh, the action is, I'll actually call it action A. Is, I'll actually have to copy this because it's the same, same things here. So action A, pick book text to librarian at counter, right? Then action guard, the action guard is if student are spending issues, don't approve book. If not pending issues, proceed to more action, proceed to more action. And which action B is librarian approves book. But then when you have B, B, also the event trigger, that's what will happen here. Because the only thing we are changing is the action guard when it is false. So nothing else changes, okay? So we just copy this one and we paste it here. The event triggers availability of book. 
action A is pick book check to librarian at counter. That condition if student are spending. So here that condition we will say check for pending issues. Check for pending issues. No pending issues. Hence proceed to more action. Okay. So that's how we have uh, eliminated the, the the condition when it transforms. So the condition when it transforms will be accommodated here. So we can actually, when we say check for pending issues, I think that will look like an action. So we'll say no pending issues. No pending issues. Hence, proceed to more action. And then here, we'll say pending issues found. Proceed more action. So it's the more action. Librarian denies book. Does that make sense? Librarian denies book, right? So that is how uh, that looks like. So, so basically, uh, basically, state check diagram accommodates for when a condition returns true and when it returns false. Okay. So there is a state for when that condition returns true and as uh, that condition returns false, and a state for when that condition returns true. And then the other unique thing about the set chart diagram is that we have a initial state and a final state and the initial state and final states are not named they are treated as abstract elements that don't have names which whose role is just to indicate the beginning of actions and the end of actions just that okay so this is uh, how it looks like now i'm going to give you a scenario i'm going to give you a scenario i'm going to give you a scenario and uh, the scenario says the following. I'm going to give you a scenario. I just wait. I'm trying to find out if. We will spend a lot of time looking at that scenario. Well, who has a question before I proceed? Any question before I proceed? Denver, do you have a question? Gideon? Kelvin? Ikwech, have you understood? Leland? Linus, Muinde, Warren, have you understood or do you need any clarification for anything? Anyone who needs any clarification for anything? Okay, if there is no clarification, then that is fine. Then uh, no question, no clarification. So we are going to move on to Okay, 
let's move on to functional modeling and uh, according to the unit description this is chapter seven after dynamic modeling so functional modeling chapter seven or chapter six somewhere there so functional modeling i'm using a, a little a different book that shows something different but it's we are chapter six or seven you can confirm that from your course outline anyway so functional modeling basically the work of functional modeling let me share this screen so that we can uh, we can uh, let me just type here let's type here functional modeling functional modeling the this is uh, as this is responsible for showing the internal processes of a system the internal processes of a system so functional modeling we normally use functional modeling when we want to show the internal processes of a system now for dynamic modeling we show the states the different states that an object moves during its lifetime how an object changes from state to state during its lifetime but in functional modeling we describe the system in terms of the internal processes in other words what does the system do okay what does the system do yeah and this involves things like processing of data data input data output okay so basically internal process of a system include inputs processes processes and outputs those are the internal processes of a system in other words things that happen within the system yes so so that it can manipulate data and information right input process and output now uh we can also say that it depicts the functional derivation of data values without indicating how they are derived when they are computed or why they need to be computed okay so that uh, in data flow, in a functional modeling we use data flow diagrams data flow diagrams will often hear me use the initial dfds it's easier to so use dfds to draw functional models of a system okay now data flow diagrams uh let me let me share this screen so that we can move on i think i'll come back to this screen let me share a different screen Right. So data flow diagrams, they are used to represent the functional models of a system. Now, a DFD is basically a graphical representation of a system that shows the inputs, as I had told you before, the inputs to a system, the process which manipulates the input, and the outputs after processing as completed and well as well as what the internal stores now what are in internal stores internal data stores are databases where data is stored so we always have uh, data input data processing data output and data storage so dfd shows all the four or it accommodates it enables us to show how data is inputted how data is uh, processed how data is stored or where where the data is stored and also how data is output so dfds are basically for, for just that so they illustrate the transformations or computations performed on the objects or the system in other words how objects pass through input objects pass through uh processing objects pass through output and such things so they illustrate the series of transformations or computations performed on the objects okay now the four main parts of a DFD are as follows. Processes, 
this one is to show how data is processed, manipulated. Yeah. You are currently the only person in this conference. You are currently the only person in this conference. You are currently the only person in this conference.
You are currently the only person in this conference. Just notice that, right, we are now recording. So constraints and control flow, constraints are, are, are you know, action guards that can either allow or prevent a, a, an action from happening or a particular activity from happening, okay? And then uh, also the, the process is for showing how data is manipulated from, from raw data to meaningful information, then data flows, the data flows are basically to show inputs and outputs. Actors are the people or the components of the system that provide inputs and output to the user, uh, inputs and output to the system, to or from the system. Then data stores are storage points for data, which can be a hard disk, it can be a bank account, uh, things that store data, database, things like that. Then uh, control flow, a control flow is a data flow that has a constraint okay a control flow is a data flow that has a what a constraint so i'm going to show you how this works okay so how do we now represent each of these now for you to show a process in a system a computation right a computation where data is transformed from data to information so a process you show it using a uh what an ellipse okay don't mind these uh, arrows you 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 show a process using an ellipse an oval okay an oval and inside the name of the computation happening there Papa Moja. inside the name of the computation happening there mm -hmm. then how do you show data flows? Data flows are basically, they are used to represent, again, as I said, inputs and outputs, yeah? And they are normally between an actor and a process, okay? So, because, for instance, if it is you that is providing PIN to your phone, you are the actor and you are providing input, which is PIN. So that PIN is, should be shown using a data flow, okay? And there is a process within your computer that 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 checks whether your pin is correct, right? And then it executes a particular instruction. So we show data flows using what? Arcs, an arrow or an arc. All right, it can be a straight arrow or a or a bent arc. Okay. Well, let's move on. I'm going to show using a diagram so that you can understand better. Don't worry. Then uh actors these are the objects that interact with the system by giving it input or by giving it input or receiving output from it okay so an actor can be a person and an actor can also be a component in the system that provides input okay <clears throat> so actors are the ones that provide input or the ones that receive output so it, for instance a customer a phone user if you're providing input to your phone you are the what you are the actor. You are the one providing some certain actions, or you are the recipient of some certain actions of the computer, right? So, like it, there can be a customer, and of course, these are these are these are DFD for a particular system that we have not drawn. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, data stores. So, can you see how an actor is represented by a rectangle? Okay. As not a smooth rectangle, but a, a finite rectangle, okay, a definite rectangle, one with perpendicular edges, 
not smooth edges. Then data stores, as we said, these are points of data storage. It can be a database, it can be a bank account, it can be a hard disk. So how are they represented? They are represented using two parallel lines here, two parallel lines and inside the name of that data store. Okay, two parallel lines and the name of that data store. Okay, I want us now to have, uh, oh, okay, uh, just before we go to the system, a constraint is a what? Is, an, is a what? Is a conditional statement, which can either allow or prevent an action to, from happening. So how are constraints represented? They are represented using these two parentheses and inside the name of the constraint. Are we together? Two parentheses and inside the name of the constraint. Then control flow, of course. Control flow is a data flow with a constraint. So a control flow, we can read this. A process may be associated with a certain condition. A Boolean value is just a condition. A condition, a statement that returns true or false. It's called a Boolean statement. A process may be associated with a certain Boolean statement and is evaluated only if the value is true, yeah, though it is not a direct input to the process. These Boolean values are called the control flows. Control flows are represented by a dotted arc from the process producing the Boolean value to the process controlled by them. Now, control flows are data flows that have a boolean statement that have a what that have a constraint but they don't exist between actors and processes they exist between processes and processes so we we have one process here and another process here right so if if for one process or one computation to happen an action has to you know another process has to return true okay another process has to return true then the change from one action to another action is shown using a control flow okay control flow and uh, that's why we are saying it it move it it a control flow you only exist between a process and a, a process not not between an actor and a process for instance uh, as you can see here if we are dealing with a with a with a with a scenario or a system that takes a number from the user and then it does this it tests if that number is divisible by zero in other words if, uh, if the if it's divisible by zero if that number is not divisible uh, it's not divisible or uh, a number that is divisible by two and it returns that a, uh, a true number number that doesn't have decimal places right so that number then use that number to do something in other words if two computations have to happen but one computation depends on another computation are we together one computation depends on another computation or let's look at something that you can easily relate with if you are dealing with them person there is a computation for sending money now send money is a computation it is not controlled by the user it is controlled by the system that's why it's a process a process is what a, the system does it is not done by a user okay so when you send money the send money process the sending money activity is a process but the sending money activity cannot happen if another process does not uh return true and what is that process check balance right so there needs to be a a control process that has to happen before that process happens so the control process is check balance so the the the, the mpesa you know the the mpesa or whatever will have a module of course which is not visible to you it is the internal process of a system it's an internal process in the system it checks your balance before it sends money because it cannot send money it does if it doesn't know your balance is is greater or equal to that one percent right so this the check balance check whether balance is greater or equal to money being sent and whether of course if it can it can also accommodate for standing charges and if true if okay then do what send money so send money is a 
process. So are you getting the, the, the you know, the, are you getting the, the idea of a control flow? A control flow is basically, a control flow is basically, a, 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 you know, a, it, it shows the movement from one process to another. One process depends on another process. And that process has to return a true statement. That's why we are calling it a Boolean value. It has returned a true statement so that so that the next process can happen. In other words, the next process cannot happen if the previous process has not completed and returned true. Okay. All right. I want us now to go to a system, and then now I want us to see what we are talking about here. Okay. Uh, let me have a scenario. So um, I want to give a scenario here. Now let me stop sharing this statement. Uh, sh sharing this and share another one. Now sharing this. So here I'm going to type uh, a, a scenario. That's a, a very, very simple, very, very simple uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, so a uh, cast, uh, an application allows the system to enter, allows the system to enter two numbers, computes the sum of the numbers, and returns, I'm returning is just outputting, okay? Represent using a simple DFB. Just that. We begin from there. Hmm? So how do we do it? So now we are going to begin with what? The actors. The actor. So which is the actor? The actor is the, the user. An application allows the user, sorry, not the system, the user. The user to enter two numbers. So the user is the actor, which is the process. The process is computation of sum because a process is a computation that converts or manipulates data changes it to meaningful information so the computation of sum is process then the data flows the data being input input is two numbers two numbers that is the input and then the output is the sum so let, me, let us show now how this one works so we are going to have uh, an actor there We, I think I need to add more, right? No. Okay. Yeah. So we need to have an actor. That is the actor. So this one, we're going to call it the user, right? The user. Then we have the process. The process, we show it using a what? An ellipse or an oval. And it should be an oval, not a circle. A novel should be an ellipse, a novel. Okay. And so this is what computation of sum. And then the user provides what? The user provides input. And after input has been provided, sorry, I need a straight arrow. The user provides input. That's why we are showing the data flow as follows. Okay. And then the system provides what? Gives what? 
output these lines don't have to be straight they can also be bent now these lines for input and output should not cross okay they should not cross so this is input number so i want to change the font so that at least uh, it can fit there entry two numbers okay then here we're going to have what output um. you see how, how is that dfd is output sum that's just it for that system a very simple dfd that shows an actor shows a that a, a, you know a, 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 a process and two data flows okay all right let's let's move on and have another let's move on and have another that is a little bit now more uh you know more complex yeah let's have a, another example in this example we are going to say a customer Sorry, a system allows customer send money to their mobile to another customer. The customer, customer A. Has to customer A has to send has to enter the amount to send and pin. Okay. If Amount is enough to facilitate if the amount is enough and and also facilitate standing charges. And the system sends and the system sends there and the money customer a receives a confirmation message customer a receives a confirmation message of money sent successfully And customer B receives the money and also a confirmation message. represents the system using a data flow diagram present that system using a data flow diagram 
Okay. So we have how many actors? Customer and customer. So you have two actors, customer and customer B. So I'm going to copy these. Yeah. Also going to copy this there. Mm -hmm. So we are going to call this customer A. This customer B. And there is one, there are how many processes? There are two processes, which is the process? There is a process, there is a control process and a, a normal process. So processes are shown using an ellipse. So I'm going to show an ellipse here. Uh, there we are. So we're going to reduce the ellipse. So confirm it's a system that does it. So that's why it's a process, okay? It's a system that does it. So confirm what? Confirm. Let me reduce the fonts. Let me just draw and then I explain. So I'm drawing and then I will explain.
<clears throat> okay.
All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, so this is what we are having here. We are having a data flow diagram that has two actors, two processes, a control process and a normal process and data flows. Okay. Now the idea here is basically that a customer sends money but and another customer receives but for this customer to send money they have to provide the pin and the amount okay they are the pin for that app and the amount they want to send but this pin and amount have to be tested so these are going the pin and amount are going to be called constraints okay they are going to be called constraints meaning that uh, they are the they are what the pin and the amount are what determines whether that really that 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 money will be sent why because the pin has to be correct and also the amount has to be what the amount has to be you know the amount has to be enough sufficient and also can accommodate what facilitate standing charges okay so there needs to be a process that does what that checks the pin and the amount so that process is a computation within the system itself. So it confirms pin and it confirms amount. Then if it is okay, then it does what? Sends money. Of course, if it is not okay, uh, there needs to be another one here. <clears throat> if it is not okay, look at what will happen here. Introduce another one. If it's not okay, I've just forgotten to introduce a message if it is not okay. So the pin right. okay so of course if it doesn't see of course we are not given that in the question so i think i have to introduce it because it is not given in the question <clears throat> so if the pin and or amount is not okay user failure message okay. if the pin okay amount is enough then say the system sends money so it sends a message pin amount not okay okay pin amount not okay but of course this has to be a what a constraint Pin amount not okay if yeah that one. so it confirms then if it is okay then it sends money yeah, when it sends money now it is this particular process that will also deliver the output okay so this particular process when it sends money it has to deliver an output a message to the customer here it says the system then sends money then the customer receives a quote a confirmation message of money sent successfully so confirmation message sent successfully then it also does what it also sends money to customer b and uh, confirmation confirmation message that money has been received so that's our data flow that's our data flow diagram works by 
determining the processes, the inputs, the outputs, and the constraints You're together. That's how it works. Any question? So the arrows represent data flows. The ellipses represent processes and the rectangles represent what they represent the actors all right now what if i want to extend so that now we can have uh, let me extend this question now we can say uh the amount so I will extend, I'll just extend this question so that I can now show you the concept of what? Of uh, data stores, okay? Concept of data stores. If customer A receives, okay, the if the pin is okay and the amount is enough and can also facilitate, then the system, the system picks the amount from the customer's account. So Unona Nikileta, the concept of account becomes a what? A data. Okay. That becomes a data store. So the, the, the system picks the amount from the customer's account. It sends the money. And customer A receives customer a receives the money into what into his account and a confirmation message of money sent successfully okay and customer b receives the money so nini ni me introduce ni me introduce the concept of data stores so Ukiona words kama hizi in a, in a question like account, hard disk, a disk, uh, storage, database. Ukiona vitu kama hizo, then those are data stores, okay? Where data is stored. Yeah. So, then if, uh, if it has to send money, then, so if amount is, uh, if amount is, if pin and amount is accurate, then we'll introduce a what? We'll introduce a, a data store. All together. So, ninini tafanyika, so we'll introduce a data store. So, a data store is represented by use of straight lines. Two straight parallel lines. That's one of them. Then I introduce another then. See how this will happen. What will happen here? I'm drawing the data stone. Okay. So the data store has to be named. Okay. So this is what customer A account. Okay, that's a data store. A data store is where data is stored. And of course, for your account, your account is just a what? A conceptual. It is a conceptual element. It is a conceptual element in a system that stores your money, not physical money but money in digital form right so customer a account and then what does it do money is picked from yeah so we have we are going to represent that using a, a data flow okay 
and of course uh, we're going to we're going to say something like what says what in the question the system picks the amount from the customer's account and sends the money amounts retrieved okay so what retrieves this amount what retrieves this amount is there is this process send money it is the one that retrieves that amount and sends it okay amount retrieved from that account then it does what the send money retrieves that amount and sends the money then after sends the money customer a receives it's customer b not customer a Customer B receives money into his account and a confirmation message, right? So, into his account. So, Pia Kuna account ya nani? Ya customer B, right? So, copy. We are going to copy. Yes. Copy this. So e send money process pia ndio inafanya nini? Ndio inatuma. As in ndio inatuma kwa kwa these other accounts, all right? So it also sends to that other account. It retrieves from this account and sends to that account. And basically this or this is actually how they work. Yeah? This is actually how these things work. Right? So this is customer B account. Actually, this is even how it works in real life. I've just added the info so that it can bring in the concept data stores. Otherwise, if you don't see that concept being clearly shown in the question, don't don't do what, don't uh, represent. Okay, don't represent. Okay, okay. Because I'm your account, I'm a database. Tuka hizo usi represent. Ama hard disk. Kitu tu inaonyesha kuna data store. Don't represent. But if really you are shown, you are told, then you have to represent. So, I'm going to test this. Then I'm going to show that. Okay. So, here I'm going to have what? I'm going to have amount sent. You can see that. So our data flow is just to show what is being, what data is being you sent from one area to another. So after the data is, after that money is sent from cust uh, by this process to customer B account, then also this process sends a what? confirmation message to customer b of course a phone something like that right so that's basically how uh data flow diagram works please post your question as i do something if you have any question please post it i have muted my web i have removed my webcam <clears throat> if you have any question there you can you can ask I think this is an interesting area. You may not fail to have a question.
any question? So, umelewa venye hii kitu inaenda? Abu Bakar, have you understood how this thing is working out? Denver, Justine, Kelvin, I need your response. Have you understood? Kikoech, Lilan, Muinda, Warren. Okay then, so as we finish up and then I'm going to uh, allow you to have a break so that you can get into a, you know, another session in the next hour. Uh, you need to understand this these uh, concepts you always have to know which are your actors which are your data stores and which are your processes okay and when you understand that now you can just fit them and the good thing is that uh, you'll be working on a uh you know you'll be working on your laptop so it's even easier just insert those shapes so insert those shapes just insert them there and then you have the data flows and please know always know which data flows are going to what process or which data flows are going to what actors because uh if you can see in our system here this system shows what you need to know which is very very important like for instance e data flow ya pin amount not okay ni akuonyesha message kwamba your pin whichever whichever is wrong because it is a process, a control process, okay? A process to show, I mean, a process to determine something before another process takes over, okay? So it determines pin and amount. So this one, this message does not come from this process. It comes from this one. Why? Because it is not send money that sends this message to customer A. This message is sent by this process, by this particular code in the program. Okay, it's a model of how a real system works. Okay, so this message can only come from this particular process, but this particular computation, checking whether pin or amount is correct. Okay, and then this confirmation message comes from the send money. So always know which data flow is sending, which data flow should connect to which actor or shouldn't connect to which process or should connect to which data store yeah so you have to know all those things okay and then when you know those things then you are able to 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 to, to represent in a, in a way that is befitting in a way that is befitting so uh i'm going to give us a break i'm going to allow us to go for a break the break is going to last us 30 minutes 30 minutes or 40 minutes then we are going to start off the next session at 12 30 as you can see in our the session our session which we have already we are now ending is actually ending from it's ending at 12 is an ending at 12 p.m it's actually ending at 12 30 p.m so we are going to have a break and then at 12 30 we are going to have another session 
up to around 145. Is that okay? So that I can attend the next class, which is uh, at two. One thirty and one forty five is the same thing. Yes, for the same unit, we need now to go and uh, do another. We need to, to go and do another diagram so that we can push our syllabus a little bit uh, faster. So, can meet from 12.30 so that we can discuss at least one, or just one diagram. In this session, we have discussed two diagrams, state chart and data flow. And state chart belongs to dynamic modeling. And uh, data flow deep belongs to functional modeling. So follow that very, very keenly. So we are going to meet here at 12.30 to do another uh, diagram. Let me see which one we are going to do. When we meet, we are going to discuss. We are actually begin going to introduce UML analysis, UML analysis model. And then we are going to discuss at least one diagram in, in UML analysis. Okay, then have a good afternoon. Have a use your break well. We meet at 12:30 and introduce UML.